Ladies and gentlemen, tuning in today, we've got a hot topic that's sure to spark some debate. We're diving into the world of 20th century Chinese politics, and boy, do we have a lineup for you. Let's first wind the clocks back to 1997, a pivotal year in the history books. Here's the scoop on Deng Xiaoping, a giant in Chinese politics, who sadly passed away on February 19th, 1997. This was just a few short months away from a major event, the return of Hong Kong to mainland China. Imagine, just a few months shy of witnessing a historic moment he played a key role in. Deng, a visionary leader, once expressed his heartfelt wish to stroll through the streets of Hong Kong post-handover, which was a dream born from the landmark Sino-British Joint Declaration. This was the deal that turned the tables, ensuring China would get back Hong Kong and Macau. But as fate would have it, the man upstairs had other plans. Dong's ticket to the future was cut short. He didn't get to see his lifelong dream become a reality. It's my firm belief that Dong stands out as perhaps the greatest Chinese politician of the 20th century. Let's consider the context here. China, emerging from the tumultuous era of Mao Zedong, was at a critical juncture. The nation grappled with the aftermath of autocratic rule and deep poverty. It's in these challenging times that leaders are truly tested, and Deng Xiaoping's leadership shines brightly. Why do I hold Deng in such high esteem? It boils down to the daunting challenges he faced. Mao's legacy had left China in a state of disarray, with a continuation of his policies looming under successors like Hua Guofeng, Jiang Qing, Wang Hongwen, and Zhang Chunqiao. They were poised to perpetuate the Cultural Revolution and the People's Commune's core values. However, Deng Xiaoping took a dramatically different path. Uh, in contrast to these potential successors, Deng took bold steps to reverse the course of history. He didn't just steer China away from the brink of continued turmoil, he transformed it. Under his guidance, China began an unprecedented journey towards economic reform and opening up to the world. Now, it's important to also recognize other significant political figures of the time, such as Chiang Qingkuo of Taiwan. While Taiwan's smaller scale makes a direct comparison with Deng's achievements challenging, Chiang's contributions are undeniably significant. Similarly, uh, Li Tenghui's role in transitioning Taiwan from an authoritarian society to a democracy is nothing short of remarkable. So when we talk about the greatest politicians of the 20th century, Deng Xiaoping's name is undoubtedly at the forefront. His ability to redirect a nation's trajectory and lay the groundwork for its future prosperity is a testament to his ex extraordinary leadership. I believe Deng Xiaoping's approach reflected a distinct shift from traditional communist ideology to a more pragmatic philosophy. His famous sayings like crossing the river by feeling the stones and it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice, really encapsulate this pragmatic mindset. These aren't just catchy phrases, they represent a profound shift in thinking. In my view, Deng wasn't anchored to any rigid ideology, whether it was communism or anything else. He seemed more focused on what worked practically. It's like he was more interested in results than in following a strict set of ideological principles. This pragmatism, I think, was key to China's transformation and the remarkable economic growth it has experienced over the past four decades. In my opinion, he ended communist China and laid a foundation for China's prosperity over the past 40 years. So I think he's amazing. Another point, uh, I think it's crucial to remember that evaluating historical figure is a complex uh, task, especially when we consider leaders like Deng Xiaoping. Uh, some might see him primarily as the executioner of the Tiananmen Square massacre and a leader who pursued reforms to perpetuate the Communist Party's control. But, you know, when we delve into historical analysis, it's not just black and white. Let's take a step back and think about figures like George Washington. Yes, he owned slaves, which by today's standards is absolutely abhorrent. But in his time, that was a common practice. It's like trying to judge a past era with the moral and ethical standards of today. It doesn't quite fit. Washington, despite this aspect of his life, is still revered for his role in founding the United States. Similarly, when I reflect on Deng Xiaoping, the question isn't just about whether he implemented reforms for the sake of the CCP or not. What really matters, in my opinion, is the impact of those reforms. They led to significant economic growth and improvements in the lives of many Chinese people. So 
in the grand scheme of things, I believe Deng Xiaoping stands out as a significant political figure. His actions and decisions, much like those of other historical leaders, need to be viewed within the context of their times. Now, talking about Mao Zedong, that's a whole different ball game. His legacy is far more complex and contentious, and it's something that I've been mulling over for quite some time. Stay tuned, because discussing Mao requires a nuanced and careful approach considering the vast impact he had on China and the world. All right, folks, let's dive into a fascinating and complex topic today. We are peeling back the layers on Mao Zedong, the iconic Chinese leader. The big question we're tackling, was Mao a true Marxist and did he genuinely believe in communism? This isn't just a casual chat. This is a deep dive into history and ideology. And now on the surface, it looks pretty clear cut. The Chinese Communist Party has always sung praises of Mao, calling him a, a great Marxist and lauding the invincible Mao Zedong thought. Uh, but let me tell you, folks, history isn't always what it seems at first glance. So we're going to unpack this because it seems to me that the truth might be a bit more complicated. And so why the skepticism? Let's start with Marxism itself. It's not just a political stance. It's a whole philosophical system with some pretty sophisticated theories. We're talking scientific socialism, dialectical materialism, historical materialism. These aren't just fancy words. They represent complex concepts that need some serious study to grasp. And back in the day when Marxism first made its way to China, what came over wasn't the full unadulterated theoretical system. It was more like a couple concepts without the deep theoretical framework behind it. This meant that intellectuals like Chen Duxiu and Li Dazhao, who were scholars, could get their heads around some of it in those early days. But for others, and here's where Mao comes into the picture, it wasn't as straightforward Picture Mao, a young guy just stepping into the communist movement. China didn't even have all the original works of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Stalin at the time. Uh, and to make matters more complicated, uh, the translations they did have were riddled with errors, making the already dense language even more obscure. So was Mao a true Marxist, deeply understanding and believing in these complex theories? Or was his interpretation and implementation of communism shaped more by the unique circumstances and partial knowledge available to him at the time. This isn't just about what's written in the history books, it's about understanding the nuances behind one of the most influential figures in modern history. In reality, for, uh, for Mao and these other people, their understanding of Marxism and communism was very superficial. Uh, you can look at Mao's early famous works one is called a uh, report on an investigation of the peasant movement in Hunan. In 1927, uh, he went to Hunan to investigate for 32 days. Uh, he spent four days in Wuhan writing the piece itself. This report was highly praised after Mao uh, ascended the throne and it was regarded as one of Mao's early exemplary works. But I found that his theoretical aptitude is extremely low, as far as I can tell. First, it's not by my own standards today, but by Marxist standards. He doesn't have any systematic theoretical support. Basically, some of the phenomena I described are very simple, and he didn't use uh, Marxist theory to analyze the reality of what he observed. After the report on an investigation of the peasant movement in Hunan came out, Chen Duxiu didn't agree with it. He thought, this young man isn't so bright. But then Mao completely toppled Chen Duxiu and the others politically, then began regarding his theories as a guiding light. But really, if you look carefully, oh, on a theoretical level, it's heavily lacking. He basically denied the Kuomintang's characterization of the peasant uprising as a ruffian movement. He advocated to make a public example out of local tyrants and hegemony, even shoot them if they don't comply. And he said that all power should belong to the farmers. That's basically it. There is no very strong theoretical overtone, even by Marxist standards. After Mao arrived in Yan'an, uh, though he wrote two more books, one is called On Contradiction and the other is called On Practice. Uh, these two are incredible. The theoretical aspects of these works are spectacular. Later, the official government newspapers of the Soviet Union even began studying from the translations. But regarding uh, these two books, Anyone who knows a thing or two about party history would know these were actually written by Mao's political secretaries like Chen Boda, Hu Xiaomu and Li Rui. 
Essentially, Mao was pretty much just a country boy, right? A member of the Eighth Root Army. Even Stalin, the big boss of the Soviet Union, wasn't buying what Mao was selling. He thought Mao was clueless about Marxism, the whole philosophy they were supposed to be following. For a good while, things between Mao's crew, the Chinese Communist Party, and Stalin's Global Communist Network, the Comintern, were pretty rocky. Mao kind of shoved aside this other group, led by Wang Ming, who were the educated communist elite. So uh, you got these rough and tumble types running the CCP show, but they didn't really get the whole Marxism thing. Still, some folks argued that Mao's big projects like the Great Leap Forward and the People's Commune were the real deal in communism. But honestly, if you really dig into it, that's a stretch. Mao's ideal was a utopian society merged with Chinese philosophy, which was then combined with his misunderstood communist principles. This mashup led to some absolutely bonkers political moves back then. For example, uh, the Soviet Union weren't fans of China's People's Commune or the Great Leap Forward. Khrushchev, the guy in charge after Stalin, thought it was all baloney, not true communism or socialism. Compare this to the Soviet Union and its Eastern European bodies. When they went after political enemies, they were brutal. Eh, like drag him out of a meeting and shoot him brutal. But economically, they never did something as crazy as the Great Leap Forward in China. A self-destructive, anti-intellectual social movement. Shen Jiwa, a Chinese historian, once said that Mao was a poet. He was quite romantic. But he didn't romanticize anything, in my opinion. He just really didn't understand Marxism. People smashed their own pots to make steel, and after the steel was smelted, they used it to make pots again. This kind of thing does not exist anywhere in Marx's theoretical system. So the big question here is, was Mao really a Marxist? I'm thinking not so much. Instead, he was more like a modern day feudal emperor, plain and simple. Let, let's paint the picture. Uh, back at the start of 1949, Mao and his gang, uh, the CCP, CCP Central Committee moved their base from Shibaipo to Beijing. Mao first shacked up in this place called Shuangxing Villa in Xiangshan. But then, after they got Beijing under their control, they had to figure out where to permanently plant the CCP's roots. There were two schools of thought. One was to set up shop outside Beijing, create a whole new CCP headquarters. The other idea? Move into Zhongnanhai. And guess what? Mao was all for moving into Zhongnanhai. Now, for those not in the know. Zhongnanhai isn't just any old place. It's right next door to the Forbidden City and was the Imperial Garden back in the day. We're talking prime real estate with deep ties to, uh, to China's ancient emperors. Uh, Peng Dehuai, one of Mao's top guys, wasn't thrilled about this. Why? Because moving the CCP Central Committee into Zhongnanhai wasn't just about finding a new address. It was about sending a message. Mao, in my opinion, was basically saying, hey, we're the new bosses, but we're just the latest in a long line of Chinese rulers. He wasn't just picking a convenient spot. He was linking his reign to centuries of imperial rule, but with a communist twist. Now, that's a pretty bold statement about how he saw his role and the CCP's place in the grand scheme of Chinese history. All right, let's dive into this. I said Mao was like a feudal emperor, and let me lay it out for you, clear as day. The guy had power like those ancient Chinese emperors we read about uh, in our history books in, a, in the CCP. The whole Chinese state machinery, nobody put a leash on Mao's power. It was like he was the king and everyone else in the CCP were his loyal subjects. Take the early days of the People's Republic of China, for example. Luo Ruiqing, one of Mao's right-hand men, was totally devoted to him. Luo even said he had to be on his toes 24-7. And man, did that take a toll on him. Mao had this wacky schedule, up all night, asleep all day, and everybody else had to march to the beat of his drum. Can you imagine? You're just about to get some sleep, and bam, you've got to jump up and run to Zhongnanhai, because Mao called. Nobody, and I mean nobody, could tell Mao what to do. In his later years, he stopped showing up to meetings. He'd just have the big shots in the political bureau report back to him, scribble some notes on their reports, and that was that. The standing committee of the political bureau, they just followed his playbook. So yeah, this wasn't your typical Communist Party dynamics. It was more like the old days of a king and his subjects, total power in the hands of one man with everyone else just trying to keep up. Mao's lifestyle, total madness, I'm telling you. Let's all start with his grub. This guy had top-notch Hunan chefs at his beck and call, ready to whip up a feast 24-7. He needed a meal within half an hour of waking up, like clockwork, eating twice a day every eight hours. These chefs treated him like an emperor always switching it up to keep his taste buds dancing. 
And don't even get me started on him saying he didn't eat meat during the great Chinese famine. That's a load of bull. So the guy was living it up. We already talked about Zhong Nanhai. So what about traveling? He tried flying, but a tiny jolt scared the pants off the CCP officials. So they grounded him. Ah, trains only from then on, but not just any train. His own personal luxury liner on the rails. And here's the kicker. Whenever he hit the road, the whole country's train schedule went haywire. He needed his beauty sleep. So when his train stopped, so did every other train in China. Ish. Seriously, what's the difference between him and those ancient emperors? Mao's also got a bit of a rep as a womanizer, right? The moment he sets foot in Beijing, he's got this special 8341 art troupe up his sleeve. But let's call a spade a spade. It's less of an art troupe and more of a personal matchmaking service, all set up by his secretary, Ye Zilong. Ye's job was basically to scout out young girls for Mao. Picture this, Mao steps into Zhongnanhai, ready to hit the dance floor. These girls, they'd have a quick spin with the other leaders, sure. But Mao, he was playing his own game. Uh, he had the Jun Wu pavilion, all decked out as his personal dance hall, with this cozy little room off to the side. So he's there, watching these 16 or 17 year old girls dance. And when one catches his eye, it's go time. Get this, Hu Baolian, a crosstalk comedian, gets an invite to Zhong Nanhai for a gig. After his routine, they ask him to stick around for a dance at the Chun Wu pavilion. Problem is, Hao's got two left feet and is too shy to duck out early, plus he's beat. So he spots this little room nearby and figures he'll catch a quick breather. But no sooner does he lay down than someone, uh, probably Ye Zilong, uh, busts in all kinds of flustered. He's like, oh, are you kidding me? This is Mao's personal rest spot. Poor Ho's scared out of his wits. Just imagine if Mao had walked in with a lady friend and found Hu there. Yikes, that could have been curtains for Hu. So you see Mao and the girl singing and dancing, he enjoyed the life of an ancient feudal emperor. Uh, Meng Jinyun once wrote a memoir uh, saying it was very difficult for people like Zhou Enlai on Jiangjing, including Hua Guofeng, to meet with Mao during his later years. But look at the last year or two of his life. His own bedroom was basically full of singing and dancing and who knows what. Uh, the young girls who were 17 or 18 years old could bring their classmates to Zhongnanhai. Then they would all hang out with Mao in his bedroom. That's the life of Mao. The old school emperors had their royal perks, sure, but Mao, he's playing in a whole other league. He's got this unlimited authoritarian power, and that's just for starters. He's also got this cult of personality that's all about him. Uh, that's way beyond what those ancient emperors had. Uh, he shakes hands with the Red Guards at Tiananmen Square, and boom, they're not washing those hands for three months. That's influence on another level, something those old emperors couldn't even dream of. And get this, Zhe Jingyi, one of Mao's mistresses. Her hubby got a photo op with Mao and her, and he's over the moon about it. Think about that. Even the ancient emperors wouldn't have the guts to pull that off, but Mao, he did it with style. So he's not just any feudal emperor, he's at the top of the list. Why did Mao make it big? It's not like he was some Marx scholar, a military hotshot, or a world-class thinker. Now, the dude was a wizard at handling people. Within the communist setup, he was the top dog at pulling the strings. Here's a slice of his life story. Mao's big break number one is the Communist Party gets a beatdown in the KMT turf of Shanghai. After the Gu Shunzhang incident, where the information of the CCP leaders and supporters was leaked, the big boss of the Communist Party, Xiang Zhongfa, ends up in cuffs. And their whole Shanghai operation goes belly up. The remnants, led by Zhou Enlai, pack their bags for Jingangshan, where Mao Zedong and Judah are camped out. Here's the twist. There were loads of small armed groups like Mao's across the country. Uh, but Zhou picks Jingangshan. Imagine the what-ifs. If Zhou had bodied up with Zhang Guotao, Mao would have been left in the dust. That choice was a golden ticket for Mao, no doubt about it. But Mao's not top dog yet. He's just the head honcho of Jingangshan, not a big shot in the central committee. In fact, they even strip him of his military role. Then comes the Long March, their grand escape from the nationalists. And that's when Mao really shows his chops in handling people. He cozies up to Zhang Wentian, the guy who's translating all the Marxist goodies into Chinese, and Wang Jiaxiang, the brainy strategist with all the Soviet connections. These moves, they're pure gold for Mao, setting him up for the big leagues. Then came the Zunyi Conference, a real game changer for Mao. Picture this, the Communist Party is in a tight spot, desperate for new tactics and direction after taking some hard hits. After he succeeded over the over, uh, Soviet Li Dei, 
and the other Comintern advisors at the Zunye conference, he immediately had the highest level of power in the Communist Party Central Committee. Think about it, Zhang Guotao and other important Communist Party leaders were not all there at that time. In fact, those people were not inferior to Mao, but they didn't have the opportunities that Mao had. Think about the inconvenient transportation at that time. So, Mao gaining newfound authority at the Zunyi conference was his second major opportunity to transform his life. The third opportunity came in the form of the Xi'an incident. In reality, Mao had been fleeing even after he had seized power. Don't listen to uh, what the Red Army says. The long march is a journey from one victory to another. That's all nonsense. In fact, they were already in bad shape by the time they had reached Shanbei. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek's strategy was right at that time to repel foreign aggression. One must first secure internal stability. If Mao and the others were wiped out and then the KMT fought the Japanese, there would be no worries. As a result, Zhang Shuiliang initiated the Xi'an incident in which they abducted the current president of China, Chiang Kai-shek. When the Xi'an incident began, what was the initial strategy of Mao and Zhu De? They were egging on Zhang Shuiliang to kill Chiang Kai-shek. After that, yeah, the whole country would be in disorder and warlords would be fighting for power. Uh, then no one would have cared about the Communist Party anymore and they could slip under the radar. So this was their strategy at that time. Uh -huh. But Stalin hated this plan. Uh, he said, aren't you acting recklessly? Chiang Kai-shek is the leader of China. China would be done for if you killed him. He requested the CCP to cooperate with Chiang Kai-shek. Turns out Stalin's strategy wasn't half bad. But later, the communists played it off like they were all about cooperation from the get-go. Not true. When they first heard about Chiang's capture, uh, Zhu Dei was all gung-ho, like, well, this is it, take him out. But history got a bit of a rewrite, oh, painting them as peacemakers from the start. And these three moments, they're what made Mao the legend he was. Uh, none of this had to do with his Marxist smarts or his military or intellectual prowess. The guy was just a pro at playing the people game. Kind of reminds me of Lu Bang, that ordinary Zhou who led the uprising during the Qin Dynasty. In the middle of all that chaos, it only took him six years to conquer China. Why compare Mo to Liu Bang? Here's the thing, Liu wasn't some military genius, but he was a whiz at handling people. He ropes in big names like Han Xin, Xiao He, and Zhang Liang, and suddenly he can take down anyone he's not a fan of. If we're raiding Mao among ancient feudal emperors, he's pretty solid. The guy carves out his own regime over two decades amidst chaos. That's no small feat, even by feudal standards. But here's the twist. Mao wasn't living in the 2nd century BC like Liu Bang. He's in the 20th century AD, an era brimming with humanist ideas, constitutional democracies, and this whole wave of human rights. The bar for politicians had shifted. It wasn't just about racking up achievements anymore, but about championing basic human rights and looking out for the little guy. So Mao, as a feudal emperor, not too shabby, but as a 20th century statesman, a disaster. The guy was like a tyrant. It's tragic, really. China in the 20th century stuck with a feudal emperor like Mao, and the real kicker, he actually succeeds, spends over 20 years clawing his way to the top, setting up his own Mao dynasty. If his son hadn't met his end in Korea, who knows, it might have even continued. But without a son, he was clinging to power till his last breath, leaving a big old question mark on succession. That's Mao, for you, ambitious, but a relic of a bygone era, in a world that had moved on. In the end, Deng Xiaoping and his successors took advantage of the situation, and the system uh, established by Mao Zedong collapsed. In my personal opinion, within the Chinese Communist Party today, no one approves of the approach Mao took during those times. Although Mao's body is still on display in the Chairman Mao Memorial Hall and his portrait still hangs on Tiananmen Square, every 10 years the Chinese Communist Party also organizes a grand commemoration ceremony. But to be honest, all of this is for the CCP to prove its legitimacy. In fact, no one really agrees with Mao's ways in their hearts. Li Zihu, who was a renowned scholar of Chinese philosophy, once wrote a book about Mao Zedong. He said that in the 20th century, whether you like him or hate him, there is no way you can avoid this man because he has made a deep mark on the history of China in the 20th century. Now, Li Zihu probably couldn't come right out and say, this dude's the devil reincarnated, we just can't shake him off. But that's the gist of it. And you know what? My take on Mao, pretty much in the same ballpark as Li Zihu's, only I'm laying it out straight. Uh, the guy was like the devil walking around in emperor's clothes. 
That's all for today. Thank you all for watching. Please subscribe to our channel, State of Play in China. For more inside stories on China, you won't find anywhere else. See you next time.